start? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us and welcome to today's webinar, Water Footprinting, an Opportunity for Scaling Investment in Green Infrastructure. My name is Jenna Gami. I'm the Associate Director of the Water Initiative at Forest Trends which is an organization uh, based in Washington, D.C., working globally on finding innovative policies, financing mechanisms, strategies for increasing investment uh, in conservation. So in the Water Initiative, we focus on watershed conservation, which we are increasingly referring to as green infrastructure. So thanks yet for joining us today. We think we have a really exciting set of presenters and discussion for you, and we're looking forward to getting to the content. Um, before we get started, I just would like to go over a few sort of logistical items so you know how to participate in today's webinar. So first of all, you're listening in using your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. So you'll see that on the GoToMeeting program panel on your computer. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the question and answer session at the end of the, the three presentations that we have for you today. In your question, please indicate your name and the organization that you work for as well as the, the country that you are coming from, so that we can include that when we share your question with the panel. The webinar is being recorded, and the link to watch the video will be distributed soon after the webinar ends, uh, so feel free to dis distribute that to colleagues who uh, couldn't attend this morning with us. So let's get to the content. More and more businesses and governments are using water footprinting and the water footprint assessment to assess their water risks dependencies and impacts. These companies and governments have the potential to contribute significantly to performance-based watershed investment guided by these assessments. This webinar and our panelists will explore the potential for linking water footprinting to watershed investments. Uh, we'll explore what enabling conditions are needed and what challenges remain in linking these two approaches, as well as potential limitations or risks. So we really hope to have a pretty candid and open discussion today about these, the variety of aspects kind of surrounding the potential to link these two approaches. And we have three really wonderful and um, uh, uh, kind of well-positioned expert presenters joining us today. Uh, first, we will hear from Ruth Matthews, Executive Director of the Water Footprint Network, uh, who's going to give us a kind of a big picture intro to water footprinting and describe how offsetting or mitigation would fit into the water footprinting methodology. And then we will hear from Samuel Vionnet, a, a sustainability expert at Valuing Nature, who will share some examples of how companies are using or could use foot, uh, footprinting to drive watershed investments in the context of supply chain management. And then we will hear from Alexis Morgan, water stewardship specialist at WWF International, who will provide his perspective on the approach and how water footprinting can be used in the context of standards and certifications to involve the private sector in watershed conservation. So a really great set of presenters. We'll start with, with these three presenters and then we'll move to the question and answer portion of the webinar. So first I would like to warmly invite Ruth uh, Matthews from Water Footprint Network to kick us off. Uh, thank you very much, and it's uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, part of this webinar, and and I'm really pleased to be able to have an opportunity to discuss this uh, very interesting topic with all of you. Uh, I, I'm I'm very happy about the 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 linkage that is being indicated between water footprint and water footprint assessment, and the ways that we can uh, target our investments towards uh, a more uh, sustainable use of water, uh, and how that links to watershed health. 
Uh, so to start with, I'll just give a brief introduction to the water footprint uh, for those of you who may not know it as well as as uh, as everybody else does, um, and and then we can go a little bit into the conversation about uh, how do we make this link between the water footprint and water footprint assessment and watershed investments and green infrastructure. So the water footprint is is an indicator of the pressure that the uh, human activities put on water resources. Uh, and, and that pressure can be either from the perspective of uh, quantity or quality. And so when we're thinking about uh, the, the consumption of water, uh, then we're thinking about the water quantity pressure that we're putting on water resources. Uh, when we're thinking about how we're putting pollutants into freshwater resources and impacting water quality standards, um, then we're, from, we're looking at it from the water quality perspective. And the water footprint can look at both of these perspectives. Uh, it also is very important uh, in, in, in a difference from the carbon footprint, which you might know well, uh, because the water footprint occurs in a specific location at a specific time, uh, because it's very important to relate it to what's going on in the water resources uh, that you're using at that location and in that, at that time. Uh, we talk about the water footprint um, from a direct and indirect water use perspective. Um, this is very useful in understanding supply chains, um, understanding that uh, we might have a water footprint in our, in our households, we might have a water footprint at a facility, uh, but all of the food and other goods that uh, an individual consumes or all of the inputs uh, into the production at that facility also have a water footprint um, that are contributing to the uh, either our individual uh, well-being or the, the business that is uh, operating at that facility. And one of the things that I really like about the water footprint is, is that it's a very flexible indicator. And what this means is that we can look at it um, uh, use the water footprint to understand the water that's being used in agriculture, industry, domestic water uses. Uh, so we can look at individual processes uh, or at the product level uh, or at the company or sector level. Uh, but we can also look at it from a geographic perspective and this where this this linkage between the, the water footprint of productive processes and the water footprint in a geographic area, for instance a, a watershed, um, is, is where we'll get a real key um, linkage with this discussion around uh, how to bring the water footprint and water footprint assessment and green infrastructure together. So we look at three components of the water footprint, uh, green, blue, and gray. Uh, and here what we're looking at is uh, with the green and blue water footprints, we're looking at the, the sources of water. Uh, so the green water footprint, the source of water is rainfall that's being stored in soil as moisture and taken up uh, by plants. Uh, the blue water footprint is, is the water that uh, comes from lakes, rivers, and aquifers. And when we're looking at the green and blue water footprint, we're looking at the, the amount of water that's consumed, meaning it's either evaporated or it's transpired, it's incorporated into the product, or with the blue water footprint, it's taken from one freshwater source and returned to another or at another time. And so we're really looking at that pressure that that activity has put on those water resources. With the gray water footprint, this is the, the indicator that we use uh, for looking at uh, water pollution. Um, what we're looking at is the understanding is the, the amount of water, the volume of water that's needed to assimilate the pollutants that are being discharged into the, the freshwater resources, either directly through a discharge from a facility, for instance, or a household, um, or indirectly through leaching off of a, an agricultural field, um, and how that relates to protecting water quality standards. 
Uh, and so the, the, the three together give us a really comprehensive view of what's going on in terms of the, the pressures that we're putting on land and water resources with the green water footprint, uh, surface and groundwater resources with the blue water footprint, and the, the quality of our water through the gray water footprint. We put the water footprint within a framework and a process of water footprint assessment. And this is really important because the, the water footprint in and of itself gives us a number um, that's a volume of water uh, that tells us, you know, a, 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 about the, you know, the size of the water footprint. But we need to put that into context. And so we want to understand, first of all, how large is the water footprint? You know, so how much water is being consumed? How much water is needed to assimilate your pollutants to meet water quality standards? But then you want to put it in relationship with the local context to understand whether it's environmentally sustainable, uh, whether it's economically efficient, and whether it's socially equitable. And so what we mean by this is environmental sustainability is looking at do we have a balance between the demands we're putting on freshwater resources and the supply of those freshwater resources such that ecosystem services and subsistence uses are being maintained. Um, to be economic effic efficient, what we're looking at is our, is that water being used as productively as it could be? Or are there improvements that we could make that would make uh, that water be more productive, meaning we're using it in a more efficient way? And then social equitability, we're looking at how we allocate water between different uses and different users. And this becomes interesting when we look at uh, green infrastructure, watershed health, where one of the users of water is is those ecosystem services, is the natural environment, and we're wanting to sustain that in a way that the whole fabric of the ecosystem as well as our dependencies on the ecosystem are maintained. Uh, these two aspects, what is the water footprint and is it sustainable, bring us to this question of what can I do to reduce my water footprint and how can I make it more sustainable? And so what we're working on is a process that really helps us identify those specific uh, actions that are going to take us um, to the most strategic approaches for, uh, for reaching sustainable development. So to put this together, when we're looking at the green water footprint, we're comparing it to green water scarcity. Now this is something that is still uh, being developed in the research community of what exactly is green water scarcity, meaning when have we used too much of the land that the, that the water is falling on and the water, the rainfall um, that's been stored in that soil moisture for things that are not uh, maintaining the ecosystem. And so we're looking at that land and water productivity and that allocation between different types of uses of that land and water, because that rainfall is intimately connected with land. With the blue water footprint, we're looking at blue water scarcity. So what's the relationship between the amount of water we're consuming and the amount of water that is available? And when we're speaking about the amount of water that's available, we're not just saying how much water is in that river, but how much water is available to be consumed, meaning it's no longer there for other uses, um, and, and, uh, and still be able to maintain uh, the natural ecosystem. And so here we're looking at the relationship between the blue water footprint and environmental flows. And then with the gray water footprint, we're looking at water pollution levels. And if your water pollution levels are too high, then you're violating ambient water quality standards. And so this combination of things helps us understand the conditions of the local environment, of the local resource, of the watershed, of the aquifer, uh, of, of a large river basin, uh, and, and helps us understand 
by looking at the water footprints, what are the impacts that our productive activities are having on the local watershed, and, and of what type of impacts are they? Is it that we are converting too much land from natural, uh, natural uh, vegetation uh, and, and um, yeah, natural uh, ecosystems uh, and, and turning it into agriculture and or other activities? Or are we uh, actually consuming too much water from lakes, rivers, and aquifers and therefore we're facing blue water scarcity? Or is it that we're putting too much pollution in? And, and how this becomes uh, interesting to this conversation about green infrastructure, watershed health, uh, and, and looking for the solutions that are really going to create an integrated approach to managing our water resources, is that we have that understanding of the demands that we're putting on the, on the, on the watershed. Um, and what is that, uh, how is that relating to the supply that's there? So these maps that you see here are of, you know, some uh, the five watersheds in, in northeast of London uh, where we did a detailed assessment looking at the, the water scarcity both in the surface water and the groundwater, the water pollution levels uh, both in the surface and the groundwater and, the, and you know, looking at them over time um, on a monthly basis and seeing where the problems are arising and then being able to to do a forensic activity to understand what are the contributing factors to these, uh, these basins being out of balance. And once we understand those contributing factors, then we can look at those solutions that can either be implemented through gray infrastructure, uh, or they can be implemented uh, through, uh, through green infrastructure. And so this uh, process lays the groundwork for us to understand the relationship between demand and supply, both spatially and temporally, to identify ecosystem services that could balance that demand and supply, how we can build climate resilience into improving water productivity and freshwater ecosystems by the way that we do our productive activities and maintain healthy ecosystems, and that we can do this by using a holistic approach uh, to water quantity and quality, different water sources, to really build that integrated picture that will lead us down the most uh, efficient and effective path um, towards sustainable development. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and so as we turn over the controls to Samuel, I just wanted to follow up and ask you, um, so the Water Footprint Network has been a leader in providing methodologies for conducting water footprint assessment. Um, if What's the what's the state of the are or the state of available methodologies at the moment for um, for corporations, organizations, cities, countries who have done their water uh, footprint assessment and would like to evaluate potential options for then moving on to address their water footprint and, and kind of take that next step? What kind of methodological options are are on the table these days? Well, we're constantly developing uh, approaches for taking the information that you get from doing a water footprint assessment, understanding what your water footprint is and, and its sustainability, uh, to be able to help uh, guide companies and, and governments into the, uh, into the most effective path for, for addressing those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so um, some of the things that we work with is helping companies to prioritize among different options because in some cases they have, uh, you know, quite extensive supply chains and so where might they need to work, uh, helping them understand is it more important to invest in your operations or in your supply chain, is it more important for you to address water quantity issues or water quality issues, are you meeting benchmarks and, and efficient enough, and so in fact what you need to be doing is working collectively with others 
uh, to solve the problems that are shared uh, in in the in the uh, watershed that you're operating in. Mm -hmm. And so we work in a very collaborative way uh, with many techniques that we've developed to really uh, hone in and target what's what's the best strategy going forward. Wonderful. Thank you. So now I'd like to turn it over to Sam, uh, Samuel Vionnet, who's joining us from Valuing Nature and who will share an example or two of how companies um, are using or can use footprinting to drive watershed investments in the context of supply chain management. So Samuel, please take it away. Thank you. Actually, four examples, uh, not one and two. Um, yeah, I will, I will give you a, a few examples of use of water footprint metrics uh, within companies um, and uh, through a few case studies. Uh, and they are grouped along those four lines, um, which I think is uh, the, the more like a standard approach from companies in terms of sort of maturity uh, of approaching water footprint. The first one is awareness raising, and most of the companies currently in the world are are really at this stage only like understanding a little bit more about what a footprint, what that means, where are the priorities, and and then uh, the second point is about strategy and in, embedding this these metrics into uh, strategy. Uh, so that uh, what comes next? Uh, um, I will give an example. Um, and uh, to to get closer to investment in in watershed uh, at watershed level, uh, we need to go through sourcing strategy, for example. And I will give uh, another example around this um, this topic uh, to come uh, to the last topic, which is uh, the specific investment uh, engagement with suppliers at watershed level. Um, and this is not seen so much at that time. There are leaders that uh, show really good examples, and I will give uh, one of them. But otherwise, it's uh, really what we want to achieve more and more in the future. Um, and as I said, most of the companies are, are still at the more like awareness raising. Uh, level. Okay, let's start. Um, so the first example I give is uh, this one of uh, Pernod Ricard, uh, with who I worked a few years ago, um, and uh, you can see here uh, the uh, total water footprint. In, in fact, it's a blue water footprint here, but we have all the result behind around uh, gray and green water footprint, uh, breakdown per country, per, per business unit, etc. And uh, the typical thing you observe here is a big bar at the top, which is uh, for a food or beverage company, typical. Uh, the blue water footprint is uh, within the agricultural sector supply chain um, and not much in the direct uh, or packaging uh, here in that case. Uh, it's not much in the direct or waste of a generation, for example. Um, so uh, typically, this raises uh, really a lot of awareness because a typical company would focus more on its uh, direct operation initially because they need to, to work on that. It also represents cost for them. So if they reduce what they use, they reduce the cost. But actually, the higher risk are in the supply chain, as uh, you can see here on this figure. And this is the case for, for most of the companies, actually. Um, so that's why it's very important for awareness raising uh, internally to engage different departments, the CEO and VPs, etc., uh, on the topic, uh, so that they understand where are, where stand the, the priorities, um, to drive them to integrate this fact into the strategy and work on the supply chain, for example. Um, so that's the first step and the first case study, very simple. Um, so then, still Pernod Ricard and how they work on. Let me change the slide. Yeah. Um, and how they work uh, within the supply chain. Um, again, you use the same metrics uh, here, blue water footprint, uh, that you split per commodity, uh, per region, or per affiliate here, which is a kind of a business unit in the case of Pernod Ricard. And you link it, as uh, Ruth uh, said, uh, to the local context, to the blue water scarcity, uh, the green water with the green water scarcity, etc. You put some context around the number, you understand where this water use or consume is a problem. Uh, or might cause a problem or might be at risk. And that's uh, the columns on the right you see here. Um, actually, it's a legend at the bottom is wrong, but anyway, it's the water scarcity, uh, simply. Um, the blue water scarcity uh, that shows a little bit the context over the competition over the water. And you use this information to prioritize the affiliate. And uh, most of the cases, um, companies will put a higher target in terms of water reduction. Uh, to the side that are in water scarce areas. And that's a typical answer from this type of analysis. 
and uh, the, the water footprint assessment is very, <coughs> very powerful to identify those sites. Um, so third uh, example um, of, uh, of use of water footprint is um, uh, within the sourcing strategy and uh, again a quite uh, let's say technical uh, figure I, I need to show you because we're talking about water footprint it's still, um, still about uh, metrics. You see here uh, a sourcing um, water footprint split per scarcity level. So on the y axis you have the cubic meters of blue water consumed per year. Uh, of all the commodities that are purchased, all the purchasing, uh, and uh, you see the different columns or the, the x-axis is actually the water scarcity level. Um, and you can see three lines which represent three years, and you can see that over the years they change their suppliers and their sourcing. So you see um, in that case that they increase uh, the exposition to, to scarcity. Um, on the, the, the far right uh, column, the last uh, column, extremely high is the water scarcity. You see it goes from the blue to the orange and, and gray lines and they increase exposition uh, of sourcing in high water scarcity area. Um, so this is uh, not necessarily going in the right direction for this company and this is very powerful also to monitor this, uh, understand uh, how the sourcing policy, the supply, uh, the, the the purchasing of, uh, of different communities will influence your exposition to water risk. Um, and this will, this will trigger action internally. Uh, this type of information was really helpful in engaging the purchasing department. Um, they, they have a traditional risk assessment approach, uh, but this is more specific to water and this works really well um, to get them on board and work and be part of the strategy to address water risk. Um, so I think this is a type of uh, analysis that speaks internally to, uh, to purchasing department or financial department, etc. Um, to trigger then action either in terms of sourcing strategy by, by engaging with, uh, with suppliers or changing region to some extent. But most of the time companies um, uh, want to engage with suppliers to address the risk. And that's where the investment in water in, um, in, in watershed uh, comes into, into play. And that's the fourth uh, case study that I'm showing here, which is actually a case study um, um, from soybean farming in Bolivia. <coughs> and uh, this is part of uh, many different big companies' uh, supply chain. Um, and uh, we use water footprint to understand how um, the uh, agricultural sector in the region, and specifically the soybean sector, was relying on the water and uh, what can be done to ensure that uh, this agricultural sector keep its yield, its productivity, uh, thanks to the water uh, that is provided, in that case thanks to the local forest. So the question is how the agricultural sector, why the agricultural sector would, would invest in, uh, in watershed conservation um, and to maintain its water flows. What we did is a water footprint, as I said, and we realized that uh, the green water, which comes from local climate, from rain, um, and the fresh water, the blue water, actually the soybean, or the, even the agricultural sector in the region is mostly rain-fed. Uh, irrigation is not that common. Um, so uh, you can see that uh, soybean is 47% is, uh, of this green water appropriation in the region, so it's a very important player and uh, it is really well exposed to climate variability. So um, in the future, the blue water, which is really low at the moment, the blue water footprint, might become really important to mitigate the effect of climate change, in particular due to the fact that deforestation is, is, has a high rate in the region, and that if you deforest, you get less rainfall, and so you affect your green water. So it's a kind of a loop, uh, and so both green and, and blue water were identified as really important and key for the agricultural sector. That's only because we measure that with the water footprint assessment that we were able to identify this. Um, so the next step based on this case study was to identify what is the cost to the business or to the sector of uh, having less green water, for example. So we valued those green and blue water, we put a value on, on top of it, to understand how this, um, this sector might be affected in the future and we realize that given the rate of deforestation in the region and the, the global climate change issue 
we are facing a decline rainfall and this will affect yields in the soybean um, in the soybean production and this represents in a, in a small region near Santa Cruz it represents 30 million dollars per year of loss of productivity on average um, so this is very important and if you think of investing part of these costs that they will lose uh, in the future if they don't do anything if you invest only a fraction of this money into forest conservation or in the investment in watershed to maintain your access to, to the water resources and maintain the, the rainfall, for example, then you might uh, avoid this loss in the future in the first place. So that's where investment is, uh, is really um, uh, can be identified within the supply chain of a company. Um, also, it's always uh, tricky, like it's a long-term process to uh, engage with stakeholders. It's not because we see that uh, they will change. There is always a change management uh, that needs to, to be put in place, engagement with uh, the local uh, cooperative of soybeans, uh, the authorities, uh, owner of the forest, uh, all the, the authorities that own the forest, etc. And that's, uh, that's a still tricky process, but with those numbers, uh, this speaks to people, this is about also money. Um, so they know that if they invest, they will get a re return, um, and that's the most important thing for the, for the business. And with that, um, I just want to highlight uh, again that going from the 1S, which is a starting point, uh, we will get to investment at the, at the later stage, but that's uh, the, the really the key things we need to achieve uh, right now to, to reduce water exposition to water risk and uh, reduce our water footprint is really to, to drive this action and this is only by going through the, the previous steps that we will get to it um, moving on on the ladder of uh, maturity uh, of companies. So to you, Janelle. Great, thank you Samuel, wonderful and we'll be turning over to Alexis Morgan, Water Stewardship Specialist at WWF International in just a moment and so while we hand over the controls let me ask you Sam so within, for example, just, you know, the companies that you have been in touch with, what is the, how many, what's your sense of how many companies are really getting to the point of starting to think specifically about um, investments or kind of mitigation opportunities after doing their water footprinting? Is this a very small number? Is it an increasing number? What's your sense on the kind of demand side there? Mm -hmm. um. I think there are two two things. First, um, the sustainability generally uh, the sustainability movement is is increasing really quickly. So it's not uh, like the water footprint network has been created. I think in 2008, so it's uh, it's still young, and uh, we see a, a lot of increase of in, of uh, uptake of this methodology, and so that's um, that's a good sign. And to answer your question. Uh, not a lot. Um, there are always the usual suspects that we see, uh, like Unilever, Nestle, uh, you know, all the, the big companies, the Coca-Cola, uh, Dow Chemical, that invest in, in watershed already um, in different parts of the world. Uh, but in general, it's uh, only a small fraction of the companies that really have a strategy that address water and investment in particular in watershed. Uh, using just a, a key metrics, there are I think uh, like 40 or 50,000 companies uh, listed on the stock exchange uh, and more than 100 million other companies uh, uh, not listed and only like uh, 5 to 10 percent I think uh, are currently answering to the CDP, the reporting uh, framework of the CDP or the GSI. So this gives you a sense of like we are reaching only 5 to 10 percent of the companies that currently have a strategy on water. So out of those companies that have a strategy of on water, there is only a smaller fraction that will invest yet on on uh, on the watershed. But that's uh, for me really the the key uh, to solving water issues, um, and uh, companies are realizing it and they're moving quickly in, in towards this direction. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's turn it over to our final presenter, and then we will have a Q and A session. So please do. Uh, send in your questions as some of you have already been doing. So Alexis, I'd like to invite you now to um, begin your portion of the webinar presentation. Perfect. Thank you, Joan. Um, so I'm going to try to build off of uh, some of the conversations that uh, Ruth and Sam have already um, 
you know, begun with. And just to give everybody a bit of uh, a sense of where WWF comes at this from, um, we've got a, a fair long history in this space. Um, in, in addition to kind of helping to establish and found the Water Footprint Network, um, we've really helped to move some of the Water Footprint stuff along in its application with business. Um, back in 2009, we were the first to kind of apply some of this to the business space with SAP Miller. Um, and we've developed these from a, a business angle as well as from a national angle um, in different contexts around the world at this point. We've also done a fair bit of pioneering work on market-based uh, initiatives, uh, and that ranges from efforts on standard systems um, right through to a number of uh, payment for ecosystem services, and, and many of those have been watershed-focused. Um, we've also um, helped to kind of spin off and build other tools in this space that have helped to fill out the, uh, the kind of um, watershed investment space, things like the Natural Capital Project and tools like uh, Invest and Rios, which are ecosystem services tools um, designed to really help support watershed payment schemes. So we've been involved in this space for a while. Um, but the, the question kind of is, so where has that led us and what are some of our reflections and where are we kind of um, beginning to focus? Well, some of our current focus are, are some of the things that you see uh, hopefully on, on screen there because I know that there's a little bit of a delay here. Um, but uh, we're beginning to think about a lot of the issues um, and spending more and more time kind of working as a community um, with a lot of the other players, including WFN and, and Valuing Nature and, and, uh, and many of the other organizations that, that operate in this, in this space, like Forest Trends. Um, and so I want to pick up on a few of these that we are spending a bit of our time focusing on, um, in particular the, the first three that are highlighted there. So the first of those is the water risk filter. Um, now this is a tool that we've had um, for a number of years, and it's basically an online, free online tool that helps businesses assess and respond to water risk. In many ways, it's the starting point for many of the companies once they have gone through a sense of um, what are the areas of my business that touch upon water, and, and in that regard, I think the pieces that uh, Sam and, and Ruth spoke about in terms of using water footprinting as more of an LCA type tool to sort of say, where is water touching my supply chain? And people quickly realize that most of the time that is heavily linked to the commodities that they source. And so from there, they tend to kind of go to these sorts of tools to have a sense of, okay, well, how does this actually look to risk? Um, one of the things that we are now beginning to spend a lot more time on, we're, we're going to be releasing a new version of this tool in 2017, and we're going to be linking this risk component to a mitigation response, including the catchment level responses like watershed investments. Um, it's already tied to um, crop water footprinting, so we've, we've built in an element and a linkage there. But in particular, I think the important component to think about is some of the terminology in the water space because we talk in terms of water risk mitigation a lot of the time, but if you think about what actually is being undertaken, um, we're really talking about a combination of climate or sorry, uh, water adaptation, water risk adaptation, and water risk mitigation, and. If you're kind of approaching and, and implementing um, efficiency-based solution, solutions to your water risk, it's really adapting to the water risk in, in place. You might be putting in more efficient irrigation and those sorts of things. But to actually mitigate basin risk, the key there is to actually get into the watershed and get into you know, solving the issues in the catchment. That's actually how to lower the basin risk. And so watershed investments form a key strategy in that regard. The other piece that we're beginning to look at in terms of the water risk filter is also building an evaluation module. Um, as what, you know, per what Sam uh, mentioned, this will help to enable cost-benefit analysis um, of watershed investments and really look at, you know, what is the value that's actually being affected versus what would the cost be of a watershed investment. And you can begin to quickly see where green versus gray water infrastructure, or green versus gray infrastructure solutions might make sense. So the bottom line to all of that is that this tool was originally designed to screen investments um, and it was also used to account for some of the water footprint pieces. Accordingly, I think it offers a really useful tool to link water risk mitigation to watershed investments um, and really can help bridge that materiality aspect of why a business would want to engage in watershed investments and draws from the logic of footprinting through this and, and beyond. So that's sort of 
the first piece. The second piece I'd like to kind of raise and flag is some emerging work around context-based water um, metrics or context-based targets, as you may have heard of them. This is something that's emerged in the carbon space um, in, in recent years. Um, there's been a whole science-based targets initiative that a number of the groups that you see on screen there have been involved behind. And again, this is an idea that's come up in both Ruth's presentation and in Sam's presentation, but it's the concept of really making sure we're linking water in a corporate use or even in a uh, government use context to the actual sourcing regions, to the basins themselves that provide that water so that we have more meaningful targets on water. So this is a logic that, you know, is very, very rooted in the sustainability assessment of what water footprinting does, um, but it's something that generally has been lacking out there. There are some pieces uh, that I think still need attention and work. There's some challenges, and again, Ruth flagged some of these, um, things like the green water scarcity component, the environmental flow components within the water footprinting um, you know, methodology they're accounted for there, but there's not necessarily consensus um, around exactly what those look like. There's also, I think, very interesting challenges on the, the notion of kind of fair allocation. Um, so if you think about once you've got the total amount of precipitation that lands in a basin and you account for some that goes to the, the green water use in the terrestrial ecosystems and you give the freshwater ecosystems their chunk through environmental flows um, and you account for human consumption, then how do you allocate the remainder to these other sort of economic and, and social benefits that can be provided? And so again, uh, you know, there's an opportunity here to link some of the thinking and logic that is already um, embedded in water footprinting to the watershed investment space and beginning to think about where should you target those sorts of investments to optimize the system um, in order to think about um, where you uh, shift allocations and so forth. And this is a piece of work that's being kind of kicked off um, by a group, but we're really trying to popularize this. Um, and the bottom line behind this is that we really have to get companies going beyond efficiency. This is where companies have continually defaulted to on water, and it's simply not enough. It, it's a part of the answer for companies, but when it comes to the broader systems, we need to think about context. And so this initiate, initiative really seeks to popularize these concepts um, that we've you know, drawn in part from the experiences gathered as a community um, through things like the, the sustainability assessment that's embedded in, in the WFN methodology and really better position watershed investments. The last piece on this is just providing some guidance um, on market-based instruments and in particular um, a lot of these watershed uh, investments. We've seen a real growth over the course of the past few years in the terminology in this space, in the array of um, initiatives that are in this space. There are you know, payment for ecosystem services, payment for watershed services, water funds, water benefit certificates, water restoration certificates, catchment funds, water bonds, water trading. There's a whole bunch of terminology in this space and people are getting quite confused. There's also been um, significant debate over the concept of offsetting um, in this space and again people have misappropriated um, and I think misapplied that term. It works quite well in the carbon space. It's much, much trickier if not impossible entirely in the water space. So we've been thinking about this for a while and have been trying to um, begin to um, provide a bit more guidance to uh, the community that's beginning to practice um, around these. And so we're trying to bring a bit of clarity in the confusion. We're, one of the things that has come out of this, the development of these reports, and we're developing two of them, one around voluntary approaches and one around mandatory kind of approaches or, or more regulatory enforced approaches, um, but is to provide a lot of cautions and caveats and, and counsel in turn, because there's definitely, um, in addition to being confusion in this space, misapplication of these, and there's a long way to go still. There's not strong enough monitoring and evaluation around many of the uh, watershed investment approaches that have been put in place. And so to make sure that these are being applied correctly for the right circumstances, um, we're trying to provide additional guidance to people. And so 
again, bottom line on this is there continues to be confusion in this space, and we're, we're making sure that we want to understand why we're using the right kind of tool and to really approach them with caution because they may not necessarily be the right aim depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and so there'll be two of those released coming in 2017. The timeline is uh, to be determined on that yet, uh, but I would imagine probably either Q1 or Q2 of 2017 will be the first of them. So finally, a few just uh, reflections. Um, I think water footprinting can definitely be a very useful approach in guiding uh, watershed investment. Um, I think it guides a company's logic, as, as Samuel pointed out, uh, to go from kind of this product um, identification and then taking it to the commodity, to the farm, to the watershed. Um, but it's not quite the same as, as doing a risk assessment. I would nuance those. Um, it's a part of it, but it's not the full thing. Watershed investments can be very, very powerful and they can be a very useful tool in basin water risk mitigation, but they still need more monitoring and evaluation in general. And so we really need to you know, go about this by understanding when, how, where water is being consumed, this contextual element that I think water footprinting is very well suited to in order to begin to have more targeted investments in the basins. So make sure we have clarity as of our goal. Why are we undertaking the footprinting? Why are we, which you know, form of water footprinting are, is one using because again there's been confusion over different approaches in this space. Um, why are we opting for a watershed investment? Which form of watershed investment makes sense um, and ultimately then link that back to the materiality be it from a business perspective or be it from a government perspective I think it's it's really critical that these always link back to why are you doing it is it to mitigate a certain type of risk um, or address a certain sort of shared challenge so in conclusion um, we definitely support you know both of these I think they're they're really important but it is really important as you go into using these kinds of approaches to understand the nuances that why and the how really matter making sure that this is the right tool for the right problem is a critical piece um, hopefully we'll ha add to some of the clarity in that space in, in early 2017 um, and that the key thing that I think binds all of this together is getting businesses and governments to go beyond water efficiency and to really begin to think about how are we linking that back to the context of, of the watershed. I think the fil water risk filter can be helpful in terms of some of that, but I think the, the really big thing that will be coming in 2017 is this push on context-based targets and really leveraging that to, to further drive not only a growth in water footprinting, but a growth in watershed investments and ultimately delivery of the SDGs. So with that, I will say thank you. Um, yeah. Wonderful, thanks Alexis. Um, so now I'd like to open the section of the webinar when we have a bit of Q&A between each of the, the or be, between the entire panel. And I'd like to build off of something that you just raised, Alexis, which is something that I think we've, you know, in general and not even kind of working directly in this space, but uh, in, in the edges of it, we've come across and struggled with it a bit, is the terminology, right? What's the right terminology to use? Offsets is, you know, not quite right, as you have pointed out. I noticed that um, Ruth talked a lot in terms of making the water footprint more sustainable and addressing the impacts of water footprint, whereas uh, Samuel talked a bit more about managing risks or addressing water risks. Um, certain companies also use terms sort of like uh, replenishment. Um, so what's the right terminology and what are some of the you know, potential pitfalls or risks, risks of getting that terminology wrong when we talk about this, especially when we start to try to, you know, link water footprints to watershed investment. So, Alexis, maybe I'll invite you to start with that one and then invite the others, Ruth and Timwell, to jump in. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a bit of a tough one. But, um, I mean, my feeling is, is that it's it's always helpful and useful to think about terminology in terms of the audience you're trying to speak to and I think that's part of the reason you see a degree of variation in the terminology that's out there what a company what you would say to a company is different from what you would say to a government at the end of the day on this um, and so the language around water risks as an example has has resonated very well with the business community. Um, it may not resonate quite as well, not to say that it's immaterial to, to government because it, it is still material, but um, it's a slightly different kind of approach that one takes there. 
I think the, the conservation community as a whole has been getting better uh, through time about aligning some of our terminology, but I think there's still room for improvement there. Um, and I think, I guess at the end of the day, you know, it's going to take some of these joint initiatives to try to establish some degree of, of common terminology. And I think that it is needed in this space. Um, I mean, it's part of the reason that we're seeking to publish some information on this is so that people can understand when people are talking replenish, what does that mean? Um, where does it fit into this? What is it and what is it not? Because people throw out these terms, but um, there's often confusion as to exactly what they mean. Water funds are another really good example because sometimes they are certain forms of watershed investments and sometimes they're other forms. And so people get very confused about them. So I, I don't think you can stop the terminology, but what I think we can do as a community is begin to give people places that they can go to try to clarify that terminology when it arises. Great. Ruth, what would you say to that question? Well, I think the, I mean, I think we all know that that there are a lot of things that have developed over the last, you know, five five to ten years. As as Samuel said, it's it's been a very active, dynamic, uh, yeah, space uh, process uh, over the over recent years, and and I think that's a, a really good thing. Uh, in in terms of there's a lot of innovation happening. There's a lot of of uh, efforts to try to feed uh, interests in, in in this in this area, um, concerns about water have grown tremendously in the last five or six years in terms of from the perspective of, of companies and and in some cases even governments, and and so well I think I agree with Alexis that that there's a lot of of uh, uh, yeah, difficulty that has happened because we're not all using the same terms, we don't mean all the same things, uh, it, it, it can be confusing to the, the general consumer of, of, this, of this material. Um, what, what I think is really interesting right now is that, uh, you know, we have a real opportunity to, to, to focus our efforts um, together. And, and what I think is that, you know, there's, there's been, a, like I said, a lot of innovation, a lot of individual uh, strategies and initiatives and, and developments and such. Um, and, and I think as we mature as a community as a whole, um, being able to, to really present, uh, yeah, some concrete ways forward. And, and this is what I was excited about this webinar for, is that, when I think about watershed health, watershed investments, um, and, and I think about it from the perspective of the water footprint assessment, it's really how can we build that, that complex landscape that has some areas that are about production, some areas that aren't, in such a way that, that we're really making the best use of the resources that, that you know, we've been given. Uh, you know, that we have available to us, um, you know, it's such, such that we, we are, are meeting these high demands that we have for feeding more people, for, you know, for achieving the sustainable development goals, uh, you know, where people have the food that they need to have, they have the energy they need to have, mm -hmm. they have the access to water that they need to have. And, and so what is the role, what of, of um, bringing forward the, uh, yeah, the, the importance of green infrastructure, watershed health, how can we do that in a way that it does get into the more engineering infrastructure discussions about, you know, okay, how, we've got this much demand and we've got, we need to supply it, how do we supply it? And so I think if we start uh, moving into a more traditional approach of thinking about things, we may actually have more success uh, because it is important for us to be able to solve this balance problem that we're faced in, in many, many watersheds around the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, so I'm going to move now to some questions that have been posed by uh, by the audience, and I'm going to put out a couple to start off with, and let's do a round on these. So first, 
Uh, James Salton from IUCN asks, as a consequence of risk assessments, what and and water footprint assessments, what benefits to actual real business has has been proved has been proven? So uh, there's one question, what it, what's the value that has been demonstrated to business as a result of these types of assessments? And um, a second one, which is somewhat related, although a little bit distinct, uh, comes from Sebastian Hay, and he asks, do you think water footprinting is mature enough to imagine product-specific water saving targets or thresholds, similarly to what we see on greenhouse gas emissions? So, for example, a ton of cement shouldn't consume more than a certain amount of cubic meters to actually produce. So, one is sort of how do we have any really good examples of how businesses have benefited from these types of assessments that we can already start to point to. Um, and secondly, are there sort of, you know, industry standards that can come out of this practice that can help to inform um, best practice, at least when it comes to uh, certain products, for example. I will say, Sam, let's hear from you first. Do you have any insights on either of those questions? Yes, I can answer the, the question of James uh, first and give a sort on uh, the one of Sebastian. Um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question. I, I agree regarding the benefit to, to, to business because uh, many times I've, I've seen many companies I work with uh, doing a, a water footprint to just uh, check the methodology and see what it gives but not really doing something out of it. So in many cases, um, finding the business case is really uh, the mm -hmm. tricky part. Um, but in in uh, in uh, some companies, I've proved uh, I've proven that it's possible to find uh, opportunities to reduce costs or uh, increase sales by uh, marketing and communication of those results, um, maintain license to operate in uh, operational sites, um, and uh, and otherwise reduce risk in general. So this means reduce cost. And uh, many companies have have shown that it is possible to make business out of uh, this type of analysis. Um, and of course, it's not only the analysis that led to the business benefits, uh, but it's a, it's a contributing factor. It's always a, a political context, uh, many internal and external stakeholders, and the water footprint information is really key in driving uh, those stakeholders into uh, getting benefits uh, for the business. Uh, so that's my answer for James and for Sebastian. Uh, what I've seen so far in terms of product-specific targets, is that uh, nobody is doing it. Um, everybody is doing it on the operational side. So if you look at the, all the CSR report that exists, um, all of them, almost all of them, have uh, some kind of targets or tracking of progress on water use at the operational level. But when it uh, when it um, it comes to supply chain and uh, full product life cycle, um, I haven't seen any companies re really, um, and committing on reducing uh, that water footprint by X amount. I know uh, only one company who commit to do it in the future, <laughs> and it hasn't done it yet. But it's uh, it's very tricky to really uh, commit to reduce. And it's not only about reducing; it's about sustainable management of water. So mm -hmm. in some cases, you just not need to reduce the water footprint or the water use. You just need to better manage it. So um, so that's uh, that's uh, a tricky thing if you want to translate that into a target. So that's my answer, and I let the other panelists as well mm -hmm. answer. Wonderful. Alexis or Ruth? Yeah, I'll definitely jump uh, in too. Great. Uh, is that okay, Alexis? <laughs> By all means, go ahead, Ruth. Thank you. Yeah, so, so to James, uh, we definitely are seeing uh, situations where the a company is really benefiting from the process of water footprint assessment. And um, a lot of that can be in terms of, of really prioritizing and clarifying what their strategy would be. And, and I can give you an example of an apparel uh, company that we've been working with over a, a number of years. And, and, you know, they recognize that with cotton in their supply chain that water is a very important component of, of their supply chain and, and that, you know, they need to, you know, pay attention to that. And so we did a study really looking at, at, a, at a very detailed level, at, you know, at the farm level 
uh, looking at the, the, the water footprint, uh, calculating the water footprint, green, blue, and gray water footprint for 750 farms and uh, cotton farms using different types of agricultural practices. And through that process, being able to identify exactly which agricultural practices were, were hitting that sweet spot of increasing the livelihoods of the farmers through better yields while reducing the environmental impact. And so with that evidence base, it's, it gives a lot of credibility to a company to say, okay, we're going to invest in our supply chain taking on these kinds of agricultural practices because we have this indication that it, it is going to make the water, <coughs> increase the water productivity, increase the livelihoods, reduce the impacts. Um, in terms of, you know, setting targets, uh, at the product level, uh, we have had some companies want to understand how they relate to benchmarks. You know, so uh, are, are we a good performer? Are we a bad performer? Are we a moderate performer? And and so I, I think there's a lot of appetite in in companies to understand where they are in, in, the, in the universe of production of, of whatever it is that they are producing and, and um, to use water footprint assessment um, to target how they can uh, make improvements uh, so that they, you know, they raise their game in relationship to where they are currently but also to be a, a leader in their, in their sector. Fabulous. Thank you, Ruth. And Gemma? Yes. Recognizing that, that we're almost out of time, I'll give a 15-second response Perfect. as well. Um, <laughs> one, I would say, James, that there, we, there's a serious lack of monitoring and evaluation on this one. I think most of the benefits that have accrued that I've seen in terms of watershed investment um, side are much more the reputational and regulatory elements. I think that there is something definitely to helping catalyze government and some of the mechanisms that are required in that, but I think that there's so much more that we need to research on that one before we have better case studies. Uh, on the to Sebastian's point, I would be very cautious around product um, kind of specific pieces. I think that there um, certainly it, it gets us dangerously close into the labeling space, and I think once you're in product labeling regarding water footprinting, you're in very very dangerous space um, that I would encourage us to kind of steer clear of. So that would be my my quick response there. Great. Thank you, Alexis. And thanks. Okay, so I, I am going to have to wrap this up now. We're at the hour. I want to give a big thank you to each of the panelists, Ruth, Sam, and Alexis. You all have been wonderful. I think we have found that there is enough content in this topic to go on for maybe five more webinars and still have a lot more questions, things to answer. So we have lots of uh, remaining really rich questions from the audience, so I'd also like to thank for their attention and their thoughtfulness and interest in sort of how water footprints integrate with other types of footprinting, um, how do you convince companies to take on the cost of doing these assessments, monitoring and evaluation, hydrological assessments of watershed investments. So there's a lot of great content to further dive into, uh, which uh, we hope to be able to work with you on the panel and you in the audience and other partners uh, in this space to take on these important questions moving forward um, to ultimately ensure that we have healthier watershed, watersheds and better manage water resources. So thank you all very much. I want to let you know that after to the audience, after today's webinar, you'll receive a survey. We would really appreciate any feedback that you have. And also feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm Jenna Gami. You have my email, I think, on the reminders that have been going out about the webinar. And we'd love to hear from you directly on just feedback on the webinar, as well as other ideas or things that you'd like to see, uh, you know, in this kind of space moving forward. So on behalf of Forest Trends and our presenters and also of our donor, the Swiss uh, uh, Agency for Development and Cooperation, we wanted to thank you for joining us today and wish you all a really wonderful rest of your day. Happy holidays. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.